sick of hearing stories from friends or on the internet of trans people who were murdered just because they're different or kids who get kicked out of their houses because their parents have decided this is not their child. When you're a kid, you don't really think of masculinity and femininity, but it was so put into me at such a young age that it forced me as a young person to think about that stuff so much. This state of like ass assessing whether or not you're going to be even physically safe in a situation. And you know, and even in a, situations where there is no threat, there is no actual threat, but because it's become this kind of chronic condition and that's how you see the world and that's the lens through which you experience things. Well, who am I? Am I the right person? Am I doing the right thing? When I think about my experience growing up as an LGBT, I just remember the like infinite sense of loneliness. If we can change that in some small way, then hopefully this video will do that. So in terms of gender identity, I identify as genderqueer which means that I don't identify with either male or female sort of gender roles and social constructions of and expectations of what those, what those roles might be. Discrimination has impacted my life tremendously, um, especially not just being an African-American, but being a gay African-American, um, being in a black family, uh, discrimination has been internalized, personalized so much. I'm very feminine presenting in, in how I look. Um, most of the time, my preferred pronouns are ignored. Um, however, my name is something that I can really hold on to. And so that's become very important to me that people get my name right because when they, because I can't really count on anything else. I'm largely out in probably most personal and professional circles, um, but because I identify as queer, and for example, at this point in time, I'm significantly and multiply partnered. Um, if I'm out with my boyfriend, um, I, I lose some of that queerness for people. And then if I'm out with my girlfriend, I lose the fact that I am attached to someone of the opposite gender. So there's some navigation there. I identify as a gay man. Once I came out of the closet, I didn't feel welcomed with my male peers, so um, there was opportunities that I withdrew from when it came to sports, because to be alone in a locker room with a bunch of guys um, and the jokes and the, what can be said behind closed doors without adult supervision was, the thought of that was uh, scary enough to keep me out of those uh, sports and activities and in order for me to protect myself. I identify as a transgendered man. There have been times in my life where I have felt the need to conceal a part of my identity, whether for work or because I did not feel that it was otherwise a safe situation. I went to live with a family while I was in the Exodus conversion therapy and I was four years with this family, very involved with this family. It was like my home. And when they found out that I still was gay in their mind, they kicked me out. It was one day I was there, the next morning, they said, wake up, take a shower. Then they packed up all of my things, this home that I lived in for five years, and shipped me back to my mom's house. I think most, most of my friends who identify as LGBT and including myself um, have experienced some kind of violence or victimization that uh, is related to their sexual identity or their perceived sexual identity. I had a wonderful experience in school and many people have told me that I am a good teacher, but education is a very conservative field. So when I am at work, I am what is called stealth. I do not make the trans part of my identity known because in many cases I could be fired for it. I was discriminated against in school because the other kids didn't understand that I was not what society taught them I was. There was just years where uh, gay was such a common slur to put somebody down. So even before I came out of the closet, I internalized shame based on what my peers would say. And I still to this day actually have a lot of problems with that just because of the way I was treated as a kid. So I was bullied. 
I have seen discrimination in workplaces where someone like me, whether it's me or someone else that I know, have been let go from a job or may not have gotten the same respect that they would otherwise just because of who they are. My worldview has already taught me that I can expect stigma, I can expect to be discriminated against. Um, that's how I'm going to present. And so to have, to have that lens removed would be helpful. I would say that I've had some bad experience about seeking help after trauma only because when I was younger I didn't know that it was trauma and I didn't know what kind of help I should have sought. My first sexual assault experience was by a doctor when I was five. So I need to have a patient advocate in the room with me. I need to have a friend in there. And so explaining all of that and having space to do that and not having pushback, because sometimes medical providers will say, you know, this is a private thing, this is your session. But really great medical providers are able to meet all of those needs, and then I have a good experience. And if I don't, if, if they don't meet those needs, then in fact, I'm reliving trauma. I think the struggle for LGBTQ youth continues beyond the initial trauma, because once you get dug into a hole, it's a lot of work to get back out. So if you have spent your life being told that you are less than because of whom you happen to love or how you happen to identify, it can be very difficult to see where the worth is in continuing to be you rather than somebody else. I believe that there was something spiritually wrong with me. And I remember the, my counselor with Exodus, I remember one day telling him, well, you know, I feel like we're getting a lot of progress and we're talking about all these great things and I want to not be attracted to men, but I'm always, when I leave your office, I'm still attracted to men. And one thing he said to me was, Alan, that'll never go away. You'll have to fight that your whole life. So every day it was, you know, I have to hide who I am and I think it really traumatizes you internally because um, you don't quite understand it. You don't understand the rules of why you know, why does being gay make me less of a person in the eyes of everyone else around me? And that's when I made the decision, like, why would I want to live that way? Why would I want to fight who I am, you know? So that's how I think I was able to overcome it. But um, it was just a huge part of my childhood. I think with mental health professionals, that they need to understand there's already some barriers between LGBTQ youth and a stranger because we're used to protecting ourselves and we kind of build up our own walls that can uh, prevent us from being open with a therapist and kind of creates barriers for us to be um, vulnerable and, and open to discussion. Whenever you're sitting down with a client, always assume that their story is completely different from what yours is, and you can start from square one. As a general rule, uh, practitioners aren't exposed to working with um, LGBT clients or folks, um, and not because they're not there, but just because they probably haven't disclosed. It's impossible for a healthcare provider to adequately provide care to um, a person belonging to the LGBTQ community if they are unaware of those identities. Because when you are treating a person as a medical provider, you're treating a whole person. I want to live a long and healthy life and I want to make sure a doctor is treating not just Alan, but the gay part of Alan as well. And I look for healthcare providers to ask me about my sexual orientation or identity and not only within the context of my sexual health care. I go for routine physicals. That's something to me that you know should be asked. The thing that makes a professional environment the most safe and the most welcoming is you being willing to learn and willing to work with me. My doctor's office uses my preferred name. I don't go by my birth name, and that's part of their intake process, and so I don't have to feel awkward when they call my name and the nurses come back to get me from the waiting room. They use my name. <laughs> that is so valuable to me. The other way to be supportive is to say, you as the patient, you are your own expert. I have not lived your experiences. I have not gone through what you have gone through. So if you think something is not going to work, please tell me. 
and we will try to come up with a solution together. It's really hard to ask a child to, to express something that they may not be ready to, and if you give it time, you might get that opportunity to get the answers that you might be seeking in order for you to help that individual. I think professionals can improve um, working with LGBT clients in general by keeping up with current knowledge, by keeping up with current literature, by having those relationships with their patients, to go to trainings, to pay attention to the political arena and how the political arena has an impact on public health within the LGBT community. They gave me a place where I could share and how much I've been able to grow as an individual to walk away from the shame and the fear that I experienced growing up in, in society. And then um, they, they, you know, my, my professional, he tells me now how, how much I have changed um, for the better. And so as mental health professionals, you guys can really make a difference. Uh, in our lives. You got into this field for a lot of reasons and a lot of them are probably altruistic and you want to help people. I know that because I've had competent healthcare professionals, um, it's the reason why I'm still alive. To the other transgender youth, if you're questioning whether this is the right decision, if you're questioning whether this is what is really going on with you, if you're questioning whether there are people out there that can help you, the answer is yes, there are people that can help you. I wanted to do this video because of the help that I've gotten from my counselors who specialize in LGBT issues. Uh, I thought it would be a good opportunity to give back to the youth and to the professionals on my insight and to say how important it was to me and how it helped me along to transition from uh, adolescent to a young adult. Putting this resource out there so that other people don't have to deal quite with what I went through. That's the biggest reason that I wanted to do this. And I would just encourage anyone watching to continue on that path, to continue to be enlightened, and continue to pursue knowledge so that you can help all types of people. My philosophy is make it better. I think so many times being in the queer community, we feel so powerless. And I'd like to remind youth that they are powerful and they have the power to have the life that they want to live.